Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of the inaugural McGill Max Bell Lectures. These lectures have been made possible by a generous gift from Tom Kearns, a proud McGill alum and a prominent name for many years in Canadian business and Canadian public policy. When Tom Kearns first suggested to me the idea of funding a lecture series, we were discussing the need for better debates about Canadian fiscal policy, government spending, budget deficits, public debt, and tax structures. Tom and I share concerns about fiscal responsibility and that it will need to be taken more seriously in the near future. But I told Tom that a set of lectures focused so narrowly might be viewed as a little too niche. He and I would love it, but how many other people would want to attend? We soon agreed that a broader focus on economic policy would be appropriate, and given Canada's many challenges on this front, there would be no shortage of great things to talk about and terrific people to deliver the lectures. So the subtitle of the McGill Max Bell Lectures is Economic Ideas for a Stronger Canada. And I want to thank Tom Kearns and his wife Mary Janigan very much for their vision and their generosity. My name is Chris Reagan, and aside from being an economist who cares pretty deeply about Canada's policy challenges, I am the director of the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University. I'm also born and raised in Alberta, I really should say Edmonton, but I know that doesn't go over so well in this part of the province. Uh, and I'm always happy to come back here, if only briefly. I was actually hoping for a little warmer weather. Uh, what I left in Montreal uh, yesterday was about 10 above and fall colors and lovely, and that's not what I was received with here. <clears throat> but I move on. The Max Bell School launched to the public in the fall of 2017, and since then we have been building many things, including an intensive and innovative Master of Public Policy program, research centers, policy boot camps for journalists, partnerships with think tanks, and public events on various policy topics. This major set of lectures on economic policy is our latest creation, and I'm delighted at how things have been working out, at least so far. The vision of the McGill Max Bell Lectures is to highlight a crucial policy issue for the Canadian economy, and especially one that we either aren't thinking enough about, or perhaps aren't thinking clearly enough about. In addition, it is to provide a platform for a policy thinker who is not yet a household name, even among those households which discuss policy. There will be three lectures each year, one in Montreal, one in Western Canada, and the third in some city that somehow aligns with the importance of the topic. Finally, the vision is to ensure that each year the central ideas are contained in a book that is written in a manner that makes the policy issue accessible to normal people. At this point, I should admit that it took me uh, 25 years or so to truly recognize that economists were not normal people. I may be a slow learner on this front. On this last point, I want to extend a sincere thanks to Ken White, whose Sutherland House will be publishing these books and has published these books. His immediate enthusiasm for the project was quite heartening, and he, like many boys raised in Edmonton, is a pleasure to work with. The topic of this year's lectures is climate change and climate policy. We have certainly been discussing this issue a lot in Canada over the past few years, but my own view is that we haven't necessarily been discussing it as seriously or as productively as we could and should. We still have some work to do on this front. In 1945, Hugh McLennan wrote a novel called Two Solitudes a book about the perceived inabilities to communicate between Francophones and Anglophones, and by extension between Quebec and Canada. Now these two solitudes may still exist, but they aren't nearly as stark as they were then, or even in the 1980s, or even in 1995, neither in Quebec nor in Canada. Today, however, I think Canada has two new solitudes, at least as regards the debates about climate change and climate policy. What are these two new solitudes? Around Montreal and Ottawa and Toronto, my temporary end of the country, it is easy to find people who believe strongly that climate change is a problem and that we and our governments need to act aggressively. 
Many of these people also believe that fossil fuels are essentially immoral and that it is inconceivable that a federal government claiming to care about climate change could purchase the TMX pipeline and expand its capacity. They would like to shut down Canada's oil patch as soon as possible. At this end of the country, it is easy to find people who acknowledge the seriousness of climate change, but they worry a lot about Canadian climate policy. In particular, they view aggressive Canadian carbon pricing and other emissions reduction policies as a threat to the significant income generated every day in the oil patch. They see little sense in denying ourselves these benefits, especially since Canada is such a small part of the global climate problem. I think both of these solitudes are incorrect. I think climate change is real and that Canada needs to do its part in this global collective action problem. I also think that aggressive Canadian policies can make a real difference. And that if they are designed appropriately, they do not need to threaten Canada's oil patch at all. But I am the first to admit that this view is not easy to communicate and that our federal government has not done a great job on that front. And the very recent ruling by the Supreme Court on the constitutionality of the Impact Assessment Act is likely to present some additional challenges for the feds. Given the importance and urgency of this general issue and the need to get Canada's policies right, it was obvious to me over a year ago how we needed to kick off these McGill-Maxbell lectures. Andrew Leach is one of the few Canadian economists who knows climate policy as well as he knows energy policy. And he knows that in Canada at least, we cannot talk sensibly about one without also considering the other. He is a master of bridging the particular rigors of academia with those of practical policymaking. And despite the fact that he is an accomplished academic economist, he knows how to write for and talk to normal people. He is a his is a rare collection of skills, and he is exactly the person we need to kick off these McGill Max Bell lectures. Last week in Ottawa, Andrew delivered the first of his three lectures on the topic of whether Canadian governments can realistically promise a just transition over the next few decades. I have to say that Andrew's answer was not very promising to those people who think governments can design careful plans to deal with economic adjustment. Tonight, he's switching gears quite considerably and addressing how long the world will continue buying Canadian oil and gas, even as that same world implements aggressive climate policies. We'll soon see what you think of his answer. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andrew Leach to deliver tonight's McGill Max Bell Lectures. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks, Chris, for, for that introduction, and thanks to the Max Bell team, everybody that greeted you at the entrance, and everybody behind the scenes that you didn't see tonight. And thanks, of course, to the donors uh, who've made this possible. And as Chris mentioned, to Ken White and the team at Sutherland House, who uh, not only delivered the beautiful books you have in your hand, but who did so on incredibly short timelines, made shorter by my ability to procrastinate. Um, so when Chris pitched this idea to me, and, and you heard him say it was a little over a year ago, so that gives you a sense of the timelines here, um, I was flattered and really nervous. Let's emphasize the nervous part. Uh, I'd never done anything like this, and I didn't really know what I had to say. I went through a few iterations of the project, but I thought, you know, really fund at a fundamental level, what do I want to tell Canadians about climate change? What do I want them to hear? And it came down to just four words. It's not that simple. And that might sound odd. There's many of you, I see a few of you in the front row, who spent your careers telling Canadians about the challenge of climate change, of building analysis of the policies to combat it, or perhaps on behalf of yourselves or your businesses, telling people how they will be affected by it, um, how policies or actions to combat climate change will disrupt our lives. I was just in Ottawa, I saw the truck roaming around telling us all how we were gonna be without electricity really soon. So I'm really familiar with, I'm not referring explicitly to that truck driver, but you know, that's what they're doing. Um, and I expect you're also familiar with some of the responses that we as Canadians default to when the question turns to climate change. Um, too often, you know, our, our discussions as Canadians rely on what I started 
calling The Little Lies We Tell Ourselves About Climate Change. That was the original working title of this book. And then I said, well, they're not really all little lies. There's some half-truths there. And there, some of them are just easy sound bites. They're true. But, and Ken said, well, you can't have that as your title. Um, like, we got to find something better than that. Um, but we use these tools to avoid difficult conversations. And so my book takes on six of these, we'll call them little lies for now. Um, it's not intended to be an exhaustive list. It's not intended to be the last word. It was intended to be a manageable project that fit really well into uh, three lectures. And my plan was to take on one of these chapters or one of these sound bites in each of the three lectures. And I was really happy with this idea until um, shortly before the Ottawa talk, and I was talking to a friend, and he said, well, that's, that's cool, Jordan Peterson does that too. And I thought, oh, okay, I, I don't know if I feel as confident in my, in my approach now, but we're, we're gonna have to go with it. Um, so you probably know these, these sound bites well. Probably when you open the table of contents of the book, some of them were, were pretty familiar. Um, some of you've probably used them, and a few of them probably have made you mad from time to time. Canada's a cold country, so climate change won't affect us. We only account, Chris had this in his intro, we only account for 2% of global emissions, so do our actions really matter? Well, don't worry about oil and gas workers or those people in Alberta. Governments can provide a just transition. See, I told you at least one of them would make you mad. Um, and the one I want to talk to you about tonight, which is even if the world acts on climate change, we'll still use oil and gas. That one, for a helpful hint, sometimes comes with a picture of an iPhone or a toothbrush or something else that's made from oil. Um, as you can tell already, I made my task a little more difficult for myself. I went to Ottawa and gave a talk about how people really needed to think a lot harder about how important the oil and gas industry was to our economy, how important it was to communities in Alberta. We talked about Mitchell's sandwich shop in Fort McMurray, et cetera. Now I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna shake you up a little bit on the challenge of climate change for an oil and gas province. So I've made it a little more challenging than it might have, always, might have otherwise been. So the theme tonight is um, to talk about how perhaps the oil, the action, global action on climate change is gonna be more disruptive to our oil and gas industry than you've let yourself believe. But, as with anything, there's another side to the story. And besides, we planned this well, the Pembina conference is in town, so at least I have some shelter if I need it. Um, so, the oil and gas industry here in Canada and around the world has definitely begun to acknowledge and made significant progress um, in acknowledging the importance of acting on climate change. But sometimes I feel, and I expect some of you will agree with me, that we fail to wrestle with the most important parts of that acknowledgement. We fail to wrestle with the crucial implication that meeting global climate change goals fundamentally means using less oil and gas. It means that oil and gas will become a less important part of our global energy mix. Now, the oil and gas industry has responded in various ways over time to the threat that action on climate change presents to the industry. Um, you've likely seen legal proceedings against ExxonMobil for their decades-long campaign of misinformation um, on the science of climate change. Uh, campaigns which we've seen little bits and pieces of here in Alberta as well. Um, and still today, campaigns by both governments and private entities continue to offer what you might think of as, as new variants of Ezra Levant's ethical oil book. Um, and you know what? Maybe this next infographic, from whether it's from the War Room or Canada Action or Natural Resources Canada, it'll really be the one that convinces people that everything is okay. Mm, alas, probably not. Um, but the news is not all bad. Uh, the oil and gas industry has been a strong supporter of carbon pricing in Canada. And it's not lost on me as I give a talk about this in Calgary, how much of a contribution my friend and, and former colleague, the late Rick Heinemann, made to that discussion and how far he pushed the oil and gas industry when basically no one wanted to hear that message. Um, and as anyone in Canada knows, I mean, if you watch hockey, listen to the radio, or read the newspaper, we all know that Canada's oil sands producers have made pretty substantial commitments uh, to reducing emissions through carbon capture and storage through the Pathways Initiative. But when push comes to shove, there's always a but. The but is, but we cannot go to renewables overnight. The world is always gonna use oil and gas. 
And the market, you're supposed to understand, will always be there for Canadian crude oil and bitumen. Now, this isn't uniquely Canadian, this optimism in the face of climate change. In the book, I quote a number of uh, CEOs of global oil and gas majors saying very similar things to, I pick on Alex Porbe a little bit because Alex is so quotable and he does so much media. Um, so Alex is like a book writer's best friend. So I have three or four Alex, Alex Porbe quotes in my book. Um, but you, mostly because he's willing to say the things in public that most people say in industry roundtables. Um, but it's not news that oil and gas CEOs are bullish on oil and gas, right? That should be surprising to no one. It would be surprising if they weren't. So what's the catch in that bullishness, in those sound bites, in that view that the world is always going to use oil and gas? Well, fundamentally, the catch is climate change. And in the outlooks that are often cited, be it by industry, think tanks, et cetera, that predict continuing or even growing demand for oil and gas, the assumption buried in them, or in sometimes very upfront, is restrained global action on climate change. Demand's gonna keep growing, but what's the underlying emissions profile and what does that mean for climate? And that's the fundamental bet that's underlying that too easy by half soundbite, that it's not just that the world is going to continue using oil and gas, that part's obvious. It's that the world is going to continue using oil and gas, and in brackets, because we don't believe they're going to act that aggressively on climate change. So, you can take my word for it up here, but you don't have to. Open Exxon Mobil's outlook, and they say it right there in plain text. They say this scenario and has twice the emissions that would be involved if the, or that would be present if the world were on a two degrees Celsius path, twice the emissions level. BP finds that if the world were on a two degrees Celsius path, we you'd ha we'd use half as much energy from oil and gas by 2050 as we do today. And if we were on a 1.5 degrees C path, that gets down to a quarter as much energy as we use today. So the oil and gas industry is well aware of the implications of climate change goals for oil and gas demand, but they often leave that part out. So the question I ask in the book is, are they hiding it from us? Are they hiding it from themselves? Or is it both? Now, it's understandable, and again, I argue in the book that oil and gas executives skirt challenging questions about topics like climate change. That's not surprising. And in the book, I quote Dan Kahneman and his, what I think is a must-read book for anyone with even a casual interest in economics and behavioral science, Thinking Fast and Slow. And in that book, he looks at how humans, when they're faced with a difficult question, even subconsciously, we pivot to an easier question. And if you were asked to provide an example of what he calls the availability heuristic, you could hardly find a better example than if you were faced with the question of how will climate change disrupt our multi-billion dollar industry? You might pivot to a slightly easier question, like will the world still use oil and gas? Now the answer to that question is an easy yes, and it provides you a nice security blanket, but it gives you a false sense of security because of the degree to which action on climate change may fundamentally disrupt our oil and gas industry. You all depressed yet? Should I just like, like pack it up? And, and uh, don't answer that. Um, so let me say first that you know, we obviously can't know either what types of action the world will take on climate change or even what a world acting aggressively on climate change will look like. Now, yesterday, you will have all seen the headlines about the latest IEA World Energy Outlook. I tried to get them to delay that release so that I didn't have to read the report yesterday so that I could give a talk on it today. Um, but they didn't listen. So, you know, what, what does that report show? It shows fossil fuel use, oil, gas, and coal use peaking all before the end of this decade. And that was the headline in the globe. But the headline in the Globe probably should have had an additional piece to that, which was in their scenario with no incremental action on climate change, that's what they find. 
They have two other scenarios in that report with more aggressive action on climate change. And guess what they find when the world reaches its climate change goals? They find exactly what I just quoted from BP earlier, that you're down to half as much energy use by 2050 from fossil fuels on a two degree C path and about a quarter as much on a one and a half degree C path. 75 and 78% less oil and gas respectively by 2050 than we use today. That's their aggressive climate change scenario. So, you know, that's not surprising if you've been reading what BP or Shell or even ExxonMobil have been telling people for years. It's not a result that should have been unexpected. At the end of the day, this is just physics meeting economics. And no, Sarah, that's not a physics meeting economics joke about you. Um, at the end of the day, if you want to reduce emissions, you can either stop burning fossil fuels or you can capture the emissions from combustion. If you want to, if you want to stop climate change, that's the fundamental choice you have. You only have those two things. And what we're seeing in the world right now is alternatives to combustion getting cheaper and getting cheaper rapidly, which means that combustion and capture or combustion alone simply become less attractive. And as those trends continue, as the world cares more about climate change and policy becomes more aggressive, that trend takes hold, technologies improve, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense. And what I want to remind you again is that none of this, what I'm telling you at the front of the room, is news. It's been in IEA reports, EIA reports, BP reports, Shell reports, ExxonMobil reports, Government of Canada reports for decades. So it's not the news that is surprising. It's admitting it that's hard. So now I've depressed you all. But now the good news. In and of itself, all of what I've told you so far has very limited implications for Canada's oil and gas industry because the amount of oil the world uses isn't really what determines the value of our resources here in Alberta. The value of our resources turns on something related, but very different. So we know that stringent action on climate change will result in less demand for fossil fuels. That part is simple math. But what we don't get from simple math is the direct implication that this means lower prices, and that those lower prices will then translate to uh, lower value assets here in Alberta. Now, that's where I think, and I make this argument in the book, that scenarios like those we saw yesterday from the IEA, I didn't have yesterday's IEA report in the book, it wasn't quite that last minute, but um, it was close. Um, my, my student Jess is in the room up top and she helped me do a graph and she can tell you exactly when the last edit went into the book and it wasn't that long ago. Um, but those scenarios give us, and whether it's your pro, oil and gas proponent or opponent, they give you a false sense of security of that direct translation between quantities and prices that is not necessarily there. Now, a few of you in the room are doing a mental math and making an econ graph and say, no, 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 I'm pretty sure I took an economics class. And there was a demand curve and it sloped downwards and there was an exam question and when that demand curve shifted downwards, I remember what happened and prices went down. Well, skip forward like one week in that econ class and remember that then they introduced a second curve on the graph. So the first there was the demand curve and then we introduced the supply curve. And the supply curve is the part that I think is most interesting with respect to the impact of action on climate change on global oil markets and in particular on global oil prices. It's that supply decision and the investment decisions that are going to drive the market that we'll live through in the future for oil and gas. And as we know in Alberta, right, oil supply is determined by decades of decisions stacked one on top of another. We're still producing oil today from facilities that were built in the 1960s, and we're producing oil from wells that were drilled over the last couple of months. It stacks one on top of the other. We're still shipping oil in the Enbridge main line, and in a couple of months, we're gonna be shipping oil in a brand new pipeline to the West Coast. So all of it layers on itself. Um, <clears throat> and how much investment in production capacity is coming in, in the coming, will be made in the coming years depends on what people expect about future prices and to some degree, future action on climate change. And I'm gonna argue in a couple of minutes, also the decisions of banks and insurance companies and governments. So why am I telling you this? Why this little digression? Because 
thinking about supply and demand in this way that we as economists do well, we often make graphs with our hands if you need help with that, um, that this could mean that action on climate change could actually lead to a situation of higher oil prices despite that reduction in consumption. If you don't believe me, many of you might remember 2015 to 2018. I remember I had to come down, I came down here one night, it was early 2016, right after Gord Lambert, who's in the back, and I and some colleagues uh, wrote up a, a policy for the NDP government at the time that introduced carbon pricing. And you may remember 2016, the winter, February, oil prices were not that high. I gave a talk in a whiskey bar on 8th Avenue about carbon pricing. So that was a much higher risk event than this one. But you might remember that period of time, it was associated with increasing global consumption of oil, right? But the prices were in the tank. Why? Because people invested in supply at a rate that was not sustainable in the global market or, wasn't, or was too great to sustain those high global prices. Similarly, if producers expect and overcompensate for potential future emissions reduction policies that might reduce demand for oil, you're gonna see a world with potentially higher prices and lower than expected or even lower oil demand. That might sound familiar to many of you, it's the world we're living in today, right? Where a lack of investment in supply due to a period of depressed prices has tightened up the oil market substantially despite demand growth being well below expectations. So don't get too excited. Um, the data aren't quite telling that story for the long term. Telling it right now, but not for the long term. So global oil and gas investment peaked at about 800 billion a year in 2014. Since then, it's never been above 500 billion globally. So here's the news story, as a little headline. It's not just Trudeau. Um, the, the oil and gas industry though, even though that's down, the levels of production that we'd expect from that quantity of investment are still far higher than those um, climate constrained trends for the 2C or 1.5C goal. So industry is betting with their dollars, not on the world that we used to expect, but on a world with less action on climate change than would be uh, consistent with those global goals. So let me come back even closer to home than global oil prices. And let me talk about what Alberta's oil and gas industry might look like in a world acting aggressively on climate change. And it's probably not as bad as some of you think. Um, and this lets me make a little bit of a pivot to another soundbite uh, that I talk about a little bit in the book that's become popular in Alberta. Um, and that's whether the discussion of whether the last barrel of oil produced anywhere in the world might be produced here in Alberta. Now, the answer to that question, as far as I'm concerned, is almost entirely irrelevant. It distracts from important questions. It's a useful way to take us away from an important conversation again of are we going to have a viable oil industry that continues affording us the quality of life that, to which we've become accustomed. Now having said that, and I told Kent, that Kent Fellows that he was gonna leap over the chair when I said that, um, but let me do say that uh, Kent Fellows who's sitting three rows back uh, in, the, in the center here, has probably one of the best papers on oil sands that's been written recently that talks about the whole industry and its financial position, et cetera. Um, and he frames this question around the last barrel debate. So don't listen to me saying it's an irrelevant question and say you shouldn't read Kent's paper. It's a great paper, I just don't like the question. Um, so as Kent argues uh, in that paper, and, and I think this rings very true, we have low production costs essentially very, some of the lowest production costs in the world right now, and long reserve lives, no decline curves, et cetera, these combine to mean that Alberta's oil sands are positioned for long-lived operations um, as long as prices remain above really, really low levels. So most people don't have that impression of the oil sands still. They think of the oil sands as being very expensive. And in part, that's because of when they landed in everybody's living room. They landed in everybody's living room in the middle of the oil sands boom from, say, 2004, 5, 6, and all that period of cost inflation through to the mid-2010s. That's when people really started thinking about oil sands, or they were told to think about it uh, because of the pipeline debate. And what we heard a lot of at that time 
was in some cases industry reps trying to remind Canadians that this is a pretty fragile industry and these are pretty high costs and you don't want to do anything, wouldn't want a carbon tax, things might go terribly, terribly wrong. And the way that's translated for most Canadians still is this is a marginal resource that is barely profitable. Um, quite the opposite is true. So the future of the oil sands depends much more on global oil prices than things like domestic carbon policy. Um, when we talk about carbon pricing and domestic emissions policy, those costs are tiny. And I go into the book, the step-by-step -step calculation, but when you boil it down, when you take account of the fact that they get free emissions credits under the output-based allocation system in Alberta's climate change policy, they have tax deductibility, royalty deductibility, et cetera, it doesn't take you very long to get down to what uh, Dave Sawyer once termed a timbit per barrel. Not quite there, a little more than that, but uh, we're getting pretty close. And they are incredibly resilient, and I go through some specific calculations in the book, to even dramatic increases in, oil sa oh, in carbon taxes. Take today's profitability and reverse it, right? Today, if you say an oil sands facility that emits maybe 0 0.03, 0 0.04 tons per barrel, and it's earning tens, twenties, thirties, forties, fifties of dollars a barrel in operating profits, that tells you a little bit about how many dollars per ton they could sustain in carbon pricing. The profit per ton of carbon emissions is staggering today in the oil sands, and most Canadians don't know that at all. So why do you have these models, like the, IP, the IEA model that we saw yesterday, that has big reductions or no growth or, or what have you, Canadian Energy Regulator has some of these too, it's prices. It's because in those models, the prices that clear the global oil market are low, and oil sands producers in the model respond by cutting production. Um, if oil prices don't drop that much, then you don't get the drop in performance. Um, I do think, before I wrap up, there are two other factors that I might mention, and we'll probably talk about them, I suspect. I see uh, Deborah Yedlin with her book with all the tabs in it, and I expect there's a tab in there called oil and gas cap. Um, governments are talking about much more stringent uh, environmental policies, and those may undermine the profitability of oil sands. The second one is that it's much more challenging to finance and insure oil-related projects, in particular in the oil sands. And I have one anecdote that I think you want to hear if it's not, if it's, it may, it probably is, is news to you. And that's the case that the Trans Mountain Expansion Project made before the Canadian Energy Regulator about insurance. Now, does that sound like something you want to hear about for like 15 minutes? Yeah, like, hands up, I want to hear about this, I'm excited. The Trans Mountain Pipeline put in an application a Canadian Energy Regulator that said, we do not want to tell Canadians who is insuring our pipeline. Why? Because they say directly in their regulatory filing, if we have to disclose it, we will not be able to insure this project. That's a much bigger threat than carbon pricing. The regulatory filing itself is really worth the read. Um, so where does that leave us? It leaves us with a very profitable industry with an existential imperative to reduce its emissions. And Canadian companies are striving hard to make that happen. Um, but I ask in the book, will it work? And if it does, will it matter? Can we decarbonize the oil sands? And surprisingly, the first mention I could find of an industrial government collaboration to decarbonize the oil sands is in Canada's first declaration of the United Nations on climate change in 1994, three years before the Kyoto Protocol. Since then, we've had uh, Government of Alberta, Alberta Research Council collaborations, we had COSIA, we had a number of other, we had ICON, and now we've got Pathways. So I hope it works, but we have a significant record of these things not coming together. And I think in the book a lot about why. And to me it starts with the fact that these projects are tied to oil sands development, they're expensive, they're long-lived, and they're a big bet on carbon pricing. So suppose you really wanted to bet. You're like, I've got some money, I'm ready to invest, and I want to bet on aggressive action on climate change. And your broker says, have you considered the oil sands? You're not an oil sands shareholder if that's your fundamental investment thesis. I'm sorry, but you're probably not. 
And so when you think of the job that an executive, like I quote Alex Porbe on this in the book, not surprisingly, has to do to convince shareholders, they're not walking into a room of average Canadians. They're not walking into a room of Chris's MPP students in Montreal. They're walking into a room of people who have made a long-term financial bet on the oil sands and saying, how do you feel about a big bet on carbon capture and storage? And right now shareholders are saying, not yet. If governments backstop it and make sure I can get a return, sure. But on my own to make that bet, not interested. And so for me, shareholders, you know, we're still gonna see only limited funding of CCUS unless those returns are locked in or unless they believe that it is truly existential to the future survival of the industry. And neither of those are the case today. They're very big ifs. Otherwise, governments are gonna need to close the gap and that's what they've been asked to do to the tune of most of a $75 billion bill. Remains to see if that's going to happen. And while it is wonderful to imagine a decarbonized oil and gas industry, I want, you to, I want to remind you of another easy soundbite that we used to hear a lot in Calgary. If I had a nickel for every time I heard the words wells to wheels emissions, remember that time when that was all anybody wanted to talk about? That 80% of the emissions were downstream? Guess what? If you capture all the production emissions with carbon capture and storage, 80% of the emissions are still downstream. And it's those emissions and global action to reduce them that is 80% of the threat to the future of our industry. Now, as you get, I could talk about this for days, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, some of the things that I've had to say so far. Um, but I think I could summarize by saying, you know, the future of the oil sands, Chris talked about two solitudes. And I think we do have two solitudes on the oil sands. There are people who are convinced this was never a viable industry, it was only supported by subsidies, and it's fundamentally vulnerable to climate change. There are those of us that know the value that has been generated per ton of carbon emissions in the oil sands and the value it holds to our province. Um, those are really two solitudes on this question. There's a little bit of truth in both. Um, and as much as Canadian industry leaders are fond of reminding, um, of reminding us that the world will still use oil and gas, that our iPhones, our toothbrushes, et cetera, all make use of oil and gas, that in and of itself is not gonna be enough to support um, the type of economic activity that we've seen to date. Now that combination, and this is my downer side, and then we'll come, we'll come back to some good stuff. Uh, that combination could have pretty serious economic consequences in Alberta. And I do want to highlight, I mentioned it in the book, and I don't have time to talk about it tonight, but remember what happens if things go bad. If these projects become unprofitable, we have a multi-hundred billion dollar liability sitting in the northern part of this province that we're relying, we've allowed industry to use their projects as collateral on that cleanup. So we do face not only an economic, but potentially an environmental calamity if things go bad. We've made a big bet, not on an action on, oil, on climate change necessarily, but on oil prices that are levered to global action on climate change. And in all of that discussion, the fact that the world might continue to use oil and gas remains largely irrelevant. So, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this conversation. As I write in the book, um, environmental, uh, uh, climate change is the environmental, economic, and societal challenge of our time. And I think, and I hope you'll agree, that we owe ourselves and we owe the problem more than sort of easy sound bites and too clever by half excuses. So I hope you enjoy the book. I hope you enjoy the conversation that, that we're about to have. And I look forward to your questions and discussion with you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And thanks again to Chris. Thank you, Andrew. Lots to think about. Um, I particularly enjoyed the, the review of introductory economics with demand and supply curves. Um, by the way, if anybody needs an introductory textbook to brush up on, uh, speak to me later and I can hook you up. Um, so I don't know whether you feel uplifted after that, right? The, part of the uplifting part was uh, even though world demand may shrink, uh, prices may stay high because that supply curve is going to shift to the left because of a lack of investment. So that could be a pretty good world. Um, 
But then it was kind of downlifting, the opposite of uplifting, with how hard it is to reduce emissions. So I'm not sure where you are all on that. Um, and I certainly hope that you have questions that you are thinking about for after, uh, after this conversation. I want to introduce right now uh, Deborah Yedlin, the President and CEO of Calgary Chamber of Commerce. Uh, prior to that position, she was Chancellor of University of Calgary, and prior to that, for many years, she was a prominent business and political journalist in, in a few of your favorite newspapers. Um, Deborah has kindly agreed to interview Andrew for the next 40 minutes or so. Andrew made reference to the fact that she's got lots of tabs in the book, uh, so hopefully she'll be able to get a question for each tab. Uh, and then we'll open things up for uh, questions from the audience. Now, I just want you to know, I'm delighted that Deborah uh, uh, accepted our invitation to be here tonight. She gave up an opportunity to go to the Doobie Brothers. So if anybody doesn't know who the Doobie Brothers are, that would actually indicate that we've got a young audience. That's, that would be wonderful. But anyways, giving up the Doobie Brothers, I think, is pretty impressive. So, Deborah, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and please come on up and take it away. So you say... So you saved me from reliving my misspent junior high school years, actually, by not going to the concert. I'm just going to say that. Um, Andrew, you have, I mean, the book is definitely worth a good read and does have lots of little pink tabs. In my, my edition, I mean, there's so many things that we could, we could um, so many threads that we could uh, follow. But I just, I, I think um, I'm going to just sort of start touching on some of the um, chapters in the book that you didn't necessarily address um, in your talk. And one of them being the conversation that we hear global emissions and you know what the trade-off between what we do in Canada and what the impact is on our economy versus the impact on greater the impact we could have on global emissions and that all, that conversation often goes to well let's export more LNG and that way we can displace other other um, sources of power that are that are um, using coal does it does it make sense like, how, how do we square that circle? 2% of global emissions, huge cost of the economy. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think in the book I talk about that's just math, right? We can't get away from the fact that we're only 2% of global emissions. So we can't promise, and we saw some of this this summer with people saying, well, you know, if only we had um, more stringent carbon policy, we wouldn't have had the wildfires. Or the upside of it, like, why, your carbon tax clearly isn't working because we have wildfires. Um, none, that's just math. We can't get away from it. But I think there are two things for Canada that I talk about in the book and I believe really strongly. Number one, you know, our choice isn't stop climate change or not with our actions. Our choice is do we want to be on the right side of this problem or the wrong side of this problem. And I think we can be on the right side of it with policy that doesn't paralyze our economy. But the challenge we've always had is, you know, we go to these international meetings, we get caught up in trying to match percentage targets with other countries, particularly the US, and then we come home, we go, oh, hmm, we've really overcommitted. So the, the point I try to make in the book is, let's have a conversation about policies, not targets. Let's ask ourselves, what would happen if the world had the policies that Canada has today, including carbon pricing, a coal phase out, clean fuel regulation, we won't talk about oil and gas cap yet, um, but if the rest of the world had those, where would we be in terms of tracking towards meeting climate change goals? We'd be really far down the road. So I think that conversation is really important. Um, and I think it's important for a reason that comes back to that math of 2%. We're small in the global context, which also means that our larger trading partners can impose large consequences on us. So some of you might remember a pipeline supposed to go from here to the US, Keystone XL, I think. Um, you might have heard of it. Um, you know, that whole debacle had massive consequences for our economy as well because we had become a symbol of inaction on climate change, rightly or wrongly. But the consequences of others' policies aimed at us can be orders of magnitude larger than, than our, our policies aimed at ourselves. Um, on the LNG question, LNG is tricky because you're right. If you say at face value, if I just took LNG from BC, shipped to the coast, pushed to China as an alternative to 
coal-fired power, that's a big emissions reduction. But then when you look at what does the global energy system look like in a really aggressive climate change world, we're just not burning natural gas on unabated almost at all. The, others, the other technologies take over, so there's less market for LNG. And so do you want to be in a position of saying, essentially, we're betting on an arbitrage opportunity. Like we're betting on a regional price spread over that kind of a long term, over that 25 or 30 year term. And I think you know, the industry here in Calgary has until recently sort of voted with its feet on that. They said, we don't want to be on the side of that bet. And carbon credits will get you part, part way there if you got them, but it's not going to get you that like the full insulation. Sorry, that was a really long answer. That's okay. I'm gonna. You can cut me off. I'm, I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna follow up though. Yeah. Um, so why don't we look at it and uh, turn it around, and say the climate effects that we're experiencing in Canada because we're only two percent of, of global emissions and carbon molecules don't have passports. They go everywhere. We're actually feeling the impact of what's being burned in China and India and other places. And when there were floods in in, in Pakistan people in that country were saying, don't make us responsible because we're only 2% of global emissions. Yeah. So that's it. So why don't we turn it around and say, hey, other countries have to make uh, changes and why is it all on us to do those changes? I, I should have let you copy out of the book and then, and then we could have made this link between the we're a cold country, right? This would be the, the link between these is, is oftentimes the, well, we don't want to act is linked with the it's not going to affect us that much. And I think maybe this summer we got the shake up that this is a problem um, that is going to affect us and maybe we can't adapt as much as, as we otherwise could. So I think we do want to be in a position of being able to push others to act, right? We want to be able to push China to reduce emissions. Part of that solution is LNG, but it's going to be hard to push others to act if we're sitting back and saying, but we don't want, we don't want to act ourselves. We want to have um, Blake Schaefer sitting up here. Blake's got a great graph of the global vehicle fleet, and we have, I think, still today the most emissions, if it, emissions intensive vehicle fleet, like uh, tons per kilometer, not just total tons. And so we're, we're, you know, we need to be in a position where we say we're taking some action if we're going to demand it of others. So that's the card that we have to play. I think so. Yeah. And um, what about this whole notion that Canada should be being be more uh, visible from an LNG exporting pers perspective because the countries that do need to decarbonize actually need what we have? Um, well, again, I, I think, so the gas story gets, gas is so much harder than oil, which is why I talk more about oil. Um, I was, to, I was you know, guilty of my own taking the easy way out. But I have a graph in the book, and you can see it if you flip through the oil chapter, of this, the range of energy supply from different energy sources, in particular from oil and gas. And there are basically no scenarios of aggressive action on climate change with glowing, growing oil demand. For gas, it goes either way. The, the range is all over the map. And it depends a little bit on, on LNG, but it also depends on carbon capture and storage for um, gas power, which we haven't done at a global scale really anywhere yet either. And so, you know, the bet on LNG isn't just a bet on the world using gas, though. It's a bet on the world being willing to pay enough for Canadian gas to, you know, ship it, liquefy it, ship it, regasify it. And, you know, so I, so I think we need to start thinking about, okay, is that, what is the bet there? Is it, it's just a, it's a location arb or a basis differential bet? And do we as Canada want to be part of that bet or do we want to leave it and create the conditions for industry to be taking that bet? Uh, maybe a who is we question is, is the debate yeah. we could have. Yeah. What do you think? Who is we? You know, I, I've been, you're putting me on the spot, which is good. I was out to Kitimat a um, number of years ago, right in the middle of the gateway debate, and I got in a lot of trouble because I was the Enbridge professor at the time at the U of A. <laughs> And, I remember that. And then somebody asked me exactly this question, like, if it were your decision, would you sign for the pipeline? And I said no, because I wasn't confident in the spill response that was uh, in the plan at that point. I said, I want West Coast egress, but I wouldn't sign for the pipeline. So but much at the time, time, yeah, yeah we won't, we're not talking about that. But, uh, <laughs> but, the, uh, but the LNG facility, I was also out there touring Galveston's project, which is, you know, still remains a fascinating project to me because it had all its permits in place a decade ago. It still does. 
And the only thing, if you go out and visit it, it's, there's a dock. That's it. And so, and you know, Alfred Sorensen, who pitched that project, tried to get every company in this town to take on a processing agreement to, to sign that long-term contract. The we should do this crowd had that opportunity for years and years and years to do it, and they didn't do it. Right? We waited for Shell and Mitsubishi and Kogas and all of their partners. But look at that list of LNG Canada. There's not a single, you know, Calgary company on that list, I don't think, unless I'm missing one. We did just see a new one come out. So I, I'm hoping that that new uh, proposal in BC that has Tourmaline and others behind it, you know, I hope that goes ahead because it is exactly as it should be. Government infrastructure or government backing of the pipeline, but private capital saying, yeah, we're willing to take that bet. I don't think the government, like if it's Canada, I don't think we should be on the, on, on the hook for that basis differential bet. You talked about policy, we should have policy that doesn't paralyze our economy. So let's talk about the clean electricity regulations and what that means because of the regional differences in the country, but also about, um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the emissions cap and what that could mean. Maybe we layer on the the impact assessment ruling last week, and that was we'll be lot. here all night. Okay, yeah, you got to ask me. You got to ask me narrow questions. I can talk about <laughs> all of those for hours. Well, every, I, I, just, but the, this whole idea of yeah. you know policy that doesn't paralyze our economy. Yeah. What? But let's maybe talk about what the federal government should be thinking about in terms of what it is thinking about. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always been I'm you know much more of a markets person. So I would rather have seen you know why do we fight for carbon pricing here and federally because the market's gonna be better at making that decision than um, government bureaucrats every day of the week. And so I'd much rather see the federal government saying, you know, not saying, is it, do we need a peaker plant to run 450 hours a year or 650 hours a year? Someone in Ottawa is gonna be hard pressed to make that call. Um, I want them facing a trade-off that says, are those emissions worth it right now, right? I don't need it to be, we have different rules when the ASO decides it's an emergency. Well, okay, what's, you know, how does that Tell get us an determined? Emergency, yeah. And, and I, you know, I want people to know the trade-off, to build the technology, to make sure that they can make it work. Um, so that's what I'd rather see, you know, given the world that we're in where um, there's been such stringent pushback on carbon pricing, Right? This is what people, this is what economists and others warned would happen. If you fight back against carbon pricing, governments go to those behind the fence regulations that don't have a big headline number on your gas pump or your receipt or whatever, but actually cost more money. This is what everybody said would happen, and that's where we're headed. So, from a clean up the electricity, reg, let's just build on that for a second. I mean, yeah. one of the things in your book is talking about how, yes, we are in a cold climate, cold, we live in a cold country, and the renewable piece is a challenge you know, for, because the wind doesn't blow when it's really cold and um, the angle of the sun isn't great. So, but, and yet we have this mentality that we should be able to just switch from system A, which is 98% built and move to system B, which is only 2% built. And that causes all sorts of dislocation from an economic standpoint, because it's not perfect substitutes. Yeah. What do we do? Well, I think part of, one of the problems I highlight in the book, and, and, and looking at Sarah, because she's going to laugh at me talking about sunsets, but I think one of the problems we face here is that so much of the research space is dominated by people based in thinking about California and Texas and the U.S., where solar is just a much better fit for when their energy loads come on. So uh, if you're an air conditioning-centric economy, um, then all of a sudden, you know, it's sunny and hot outside, great, you're getting more power. Maybe you've got to bridge six or seven hours with batteries, that's doable. That challenge becomes substantially greater when um, you're in a market like Alberta's where you might be bridging days of limited solar, limited wind, et cetera. And so then building the assets to cover that, whether it's batteries or other types of, uh, other types of storage, you're building something that your own, it's not necessarily the problem of building new stuff, it's building something that you're going to use very infrequently. So you don't have that opportunity to pay back the capital in a battery when you're only using it once or twice a year, when you're trying to move energy from May to, to December. Um, on the other hand, I tend to, fl you know, you flipped one on me the year earlier, and I think I tend to flip it this way, which is today, solar backed with batteries is the cheapest source of energy anywhere in the world. And 
if we can't take advantage of that in Alberta, we're gonna lose a big part of our advantage, right? Our advantage has historically been, we have access to cheap energy. And now all of a sudden that, you know, I don't know what the latest ones are, people in the room could tell me better, but you know, on the order of three to four cents a kilowatt hour, you can put manufacturing anywhere in the world with reasonably reliable electricity. Yeah, the electricity goes out a couple of days a year. Okay, we're used to it going out 20, 30 days a year in some of these regions. And so that's flipped the global economic balance and will continue to do so. And I think that's, you know, in Alberta, we're like, well, we could just continue doing what we're doing. But if the rest of the world is jumping ahead of us on costs and tech, then we're gonna, that's, what, that's probably what I'm more worried about than, okay, how do we integrate a little bit more wind or a little bit more solar? But we need a huge amount of investment in order to do that. And yeah. I don't think everybody, no one's really talking about the cost either in terms of how the grid changes and whether it can support the intermittency and, and the different kinds of, of, of generation. Yeah, I mean, I think we need, you know, we're going to need a lot of costs into our electricity system regardless, right? Whereas people, so whether it's lo from the local distribution level transmission up to new generation. Um, for me in the book, I frame it as the decision we face is not do we want to spend money on electricity, it's do we want to spend money on operating costs or capital. And so when you think about a solar, like people look and they say, wow, look at those you know, solar panels, they're only generating 25% of the time, their capacity factor is really low. It's like, well, yeah, but their operating costs are zero. And a natural gas plant has, might operate a lot of the time, but every minute that it's operating, it's burning natural gas and taking on operating costs. And so, yeah, there's a problem in a sense that solar, the sun doesn't shine at night, we all know that, doesn't shine as much in the winter. And I remember you did a blog on when it was, um uh, smoky in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you get, a, and the Eastern U.S. had this problem too. But you know, really, what we're lacking isn't it, the problem. Isn't solar? It's a lack of low capital cost dispatchable technology. So whether that's batteries or whether that's gas or what have you, right? The when people are arguing about our electricity is going to get expensive, it's in part. It already the, is expensive. It is very expensive. And so, yeah, that's um, it's it's in part because we don't have the things to bridge the gap when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. It's not the problem that the wind and the solar themselves are expensive. So what you've just said is that the CER could make it even worse for Alberta. Um, well, if, if we allow, mar I mean, uh, so now we're, we're into the electricity weeds, but I mean, we know what's causing yeah. electricity prices to be high in Alberta right now. It's the fact that we have exactly what people said was gonna happen when we deregulated the market. Um, in a sense, we have huge market power in the electricity system. Now, we thought that with 20 years of lead time and the power purchase arrangements, et cetera, that there'd be diversification in the market and you'd have eight or 10 major players instead of two or three, but we find ourselves with two or three major players. And if you look at what's happening, it's not the wind and the solar that are bidding up the price, it's any hour where there isn't wind and solar, then the, the major players in the market have all kinds of influence, they can yeah. charge whatever they want. And so if that goes away, our prices are coming down, uh, irrespective of CER or not. Now does CER bring, uh, probably what it's gonna do, if you think of our electricity price, it brings more zero dollar hours, right? It brings more hours with low electricity price. It's gonna require um, some additional transmission investment. It's gonna probably require some additional um, supporting ancillary services, backup, et cetera, investment. But in terms of the overall cost in the system, we'll have to see where we end up. So back to the truck that you saw in Ottawa. You're, yeah. not, you're not buying it. No, I'm not. I mean, it was, I have solar on my house, so I'd be happy if, if somebody said, yeah, you know. But uh, it's not, I don't think we're seeing those kinds of prices from today's levels. Look, there's one province in Canada where electricity prices have actually quadrupled. It's here. Um, and if you look across the country, including in the markets where we're advertising, they are less exposed to these policies, right? So we're in, we're in Quebec trying to say, like we're literally minutes from Quebec saying, hey, look, your electricity prices are going to quadruple. Quebec looks and says, this doesn't affect us really at all. Um, I do think we have you know, a case to make, but I think the case we should be making is how can the federal government help Alberta Build the energy system, build the electricity system of the future. Not how can we keep the feds out of our way so we can have the electricity system of the past. Well, well said. Um, but you, let's 
Let's talk a little bit about the emissions cap and where the impact assessment ruling could fit into affecting that sure. because we're waiting to see that released before COP. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I think, pretty consistent on the emissions cap. I, I testified on it at, at Natural Resources Committee. I think it has some constitutional questions depending on how they implement it. And then I think, I know Trevor Toome at, uh, at UFC wrote a great piece on this to say, you know, we fought and fought and fought to say we need consistent carbon pricing across the country. And now we're turning around and saying, except for the oil and gas sector, where we need a second incremental carbon price or a third incremental carbon price on these emissions. And, you know, I don't know. I, I can't see why that continue. I know why that continues to be the response. And, you know, if, if you're mad about it, Think about the stickers that went on the gas pumps and think about the stop the carbon price campaign, right? As soon as you take that tool out of the hands of government, you still want action on climate change, they start looking places and they say, where can I achieve big emissions reductions? And you've got the oil and gas sector saying, hey, we could go to net zero by 2050, right? They're jumping on it. So um, from the perspective of the, the impact assessment ruling, how do you see that playing out? Um, well, the impact assessment ruling, so one of the things, so some of you will know this, I, I went back to school in 2019 on sabbatical and I went and did a master's in constitutional law. And the reason why I did that is really simple. I realized that I was going to be an idiot if I didn't. And the reason, I, the way I was going to be an idiot was as follows. Question facing the Supreme Court. Can the federal government implement a carbon tax? The logical thing to do is open the Constitution. And in the beginning of the Constitution section, well, not beginning of the Constitution, section 91, you look and you read and you say, wow, it says right here, the federal government can raise money by any system or mode of taxation. That's what a carbon tax does, done. The federal government can clearly do it. But if you miss the fact that that's not how our courts have defined taxes over time, you've just made an idiot of yourself. And I was very scared that I was gonna do that. Um, the IAA ruling is uh, versus the, the clean electricity and um, oil and gas cap has some of that same property. It's easy to look and say what the court said here was that the federal government can't do things that affect oil production, they can't do things that affect electricity, etc. But what the court said was subtly different. It said you can't presume to have the right to say yay or nay on a project, on a, on a work and undertaking. You don't have that jurisdiction necessarily. Um, but you read between the lines, there's still a lot of federal jurisdiction there. Now on the oil and gas cap and the clean electricity reg, what the federal government will argue, they'll argue that under the federal criminal law power. And the federal criminal law power, the court's gonna see that, and they, right now they ask three questions. Is there a prohibition? Is there a penalty? And is that prohibition in service of a public good or a public purpose? We know that the environment has been upheld multiple times as a legitimate public purpose for criminal law. We know there's a prohibition, there's lots of them, and we know there will be penalties. So the court will, has traditionally looked at something like that and said, that's within the realm of criminal law. And so the challenge that the court will face on those is, number one, to say, is this a bridge too far? Is this more than just a prohibition? Is this economic regulation? They might say that, and then they might overrule it. They might say, we need a new, and I've got a new paper coming on this eventually, we need a fourth P. We need to look at the impact on provincial jurisdiction of criminal law initiatives. But that's a really, it's easy to do when you say, oh, well, they're stamping on provincial jurisdiction with this, we should have a test for that. But think of all the other things that are affected by criminal law. Operating your vehicle, drinking and driving laws. That's all criminal law power, and it all impacts things like property and civil rights in the provinces. So it's, it's harder to do than it seems. So that's a long answer, but I still think there's a challenge here, but I don't think it changed materially with the IAA ruling, and I think it's still a really big uphill climb. The IAA ruling to me was, I thought that was unconstitutional all the way along, and I still do. Um, this one, I think I'm alone on my island thinking the province might win, but it's, it's not an obvious one. And putting this in the in the um, criminal code, why do that? Um, well, important distinction. It's not the criminal code. It's just the way the courts have interpreted. So sections 91 and 92 um, lay out what the provincial and federal governments can legislate in relation to. And that's the terminology. And so 
the criminal law power has basically been interpreted as you know, the federal government's abilities to pass laws to prevent things. It's not just criminal code, it's things like genetic non-discrimination was, you know, preventing your insurance company from discriminating against you based on your genetic testing that result that you got in the mail. Um, things like that, that, um, or assisted human reproduction, so regulating um, reproductive technologies. All of those things fall in the criminal law power, even if they're not strict criminal code. And the, the reason starts with a uh, Hydro-Quebec case where they were trying to, out, um, under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, Hydro-Quebec was charged with emitting PCBs and the federal government had tried to convict them under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and Hydro-Quebec challenged it and said, no, this is not valid federal legislation. And the court said, no, the federal government can and, and has repeatedly said since, can use criminal law to protect the environment. So that's what they'll argue. It's easier than any of the other powers. A lot of CEOs are worried they're going to go to jail. Um. <laughs> and, and, you know, truthfully, the Minister of the Environment should not be threatening that, right? He, well. he should not be, uh, that's escalating the rhetoric. I mean, we are yeah. talking about fines, prohibition, and penalty. It doesn't have to be jail time. Okay. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book is also the, this notion of a just transition. You're not a fan. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, on page 78, you go through so a bunch of numbers, you compare the coal industry, the fishing industry, and for some reason, it seems quite apparent to, to anybody who will read the book that there's a lot of logic missing in terms of what the federal government's talking about. So why don't you tell us a bit about why you think their logic is flawed and how they should best be thinking about this. So, sure. I mean, this was my Ottawa talk, uh, but the, the basic argument I make is that these promises of a just transition, they just make it easier for people to say, yes, we should implement these policies. They allow you to ignore some of the costs, to pretend that those costs don't exist. Um, and I beat up a lot on a paper by Jim Stanford, that a um, former Unifor economist, uh, labor economist. That Son of a sort, former CEO of a certain company in Calgary, too. Hmm? Oh, did not know that. Now you do. I Now I know. Uh, but... I take issue with the sort of simplicity of it all. Okay, we can just bring this in, we'll decide who shuts down when, we'll have a nice little plan, we'll move people around as needed to fill the jobs that we need, and everybody will have a nice uh, transition to retirement as we smoothly transition this industry away. And, and the point that I make in the book is where we've done this before, we've done it in very specific circumstances. Small industries, so 2,000 coal workers in Ontario or, or in Alberta, 19,000 cod and related cod fishers and, and related employment in Newfoundland and Labrador was a big deal. But you know, that's an order of magnitude smaller than the oil and gas industry. We've done it in industries that were already in steep decline and that already had had lots of government intervention to keep them afloat. So as a government, you're like, do I want to keep spending money to keep it afloat or do I want to help the workers out? You know, we just had the last two years have been each record profits and record royalties and record government revenues, et cetera. Not record employment, but the oil and gas industry isn't that. And so the big thing I take issue with in the chapter of, you know, I said it's not that simple, is the, the theme. But, you know, stop telling yourself that you can make this happen in the way that you're telling yourself you can. Um, and I'll, can I pick up on one more just for... Yeah, sure. No way. So I, I'm writing this book, and I have all my chapter planned out and everything else, and I'm driving along in my car, and I hear CBC Radio, and they say, well, coming up after the news, we have a story of a major oil and gas uh, producing country that has you know, found a way to transition away from oil and gas to renewable energy and keep their workers and, and eliminate cost to workers. And I thought, well, this will be interesting. So I'm sitting in my car... It was, wasn't idling, I promise. Um, but uh, sitting in my car listening to this, I'm like, who is this major oil and gas producer? And it turns out it's Denmark. I'm like, Denmark? Okay, and you know, that, that's really, to me, is like the perfect example of this. Because yes, Denmark did transition and is in the process of transitioning away from oil and gas, but their oil and gas production has been declining for decades. It's a relatively small part of their economy. Um, it's nowhere near comparable to the industry that we have here, but it makes for a nice soundbite because the same area that was the hub of the offshore oil industry is now the hub of the wind energy industry. And it's right there and it's in the same place. And I think that's the last piece that I talk about a lot is, yeah, we might have solar jobs in Alberta, but we're not gonna have them in Fort McMurray. 
right? We might have, and, and we talk about these things in a way that we would never talk about. You, know, you wouldn't pat someone on the back in Ottawa after their like, tech job was lost and say, but don't worry, I hear the auto industry in Windsor is hiring. But we absolutely do, but there's lots of solar in Alberta. Yeah, have you driven from Fort McMurray to Lethbridge? It's a long, long, long way. And I think that's the, the disconnect I, I pick up on the book, in the book as well. And also the relative, you know, the, this, the disconnect in terms of what it represents from an economic standpoint. Yeah. Like high paying jobs, the economy, et cetera. Well, yeah, that, there's a graph in there. It's probably, I think it was Chris's favorite graph in the book uh, was the, wages that you know take the cod fishery for example so the average newfoundland cod fisher when the industry shut down earned a third of the average newfoundland salary which was smaller than the average canadian salary the average alberta oil and gas worker earns about three times as much as the average canadian salary so now you're trying to re you're not trying to replace you know give this person an average job it's a windfall this is the average canadian job to a former oil and gas worker that's a you know financial crisis, and and I think that's the piece that that I I try to get to in the in the book as well. Time for questions from the floor. Microphone here at each end, and I'm going to let Deborah moderate the the, the questions. Uh, one request for people that want to ask questions: so line up at the mics, or how are we doing? Are, are we moving around with mics? Oh, okay. So we're moving around. But uh, please don't give us a long view of the world. Please give us a fairly short and pithy question. And then we will get short and pithy answers from Andrew. And then we will have more questions and answers overall. I didn't so put up your hand and people will. The microphone will come to you. I have no idea. Hi, Andrew. Um, Chris is sort of my boss because they let me teach at Max Bell, so I'm going to do a fiscal question. You were very impressive in giving us optimism on the price of oil down the road, but you didn't talk as much, unless I missed it, about quantity of oil down the road going out of Alberta. So let me put this in a fiscal way. How much less oil and gas revenues as a percentage of their budget will Alberta be receiving in 2050 than they are today? My laptop's it. downstairs. Uh, I think I have my HP 12C. So, so 2050 is hard because most of the in-situ projects don't have quite that long in their plans. So I think the, the question, you know, we have a big build-out of in-situ in early 2000s to 2015. A lot of those are sort of 25 to 35-year project plans. So I think that's more the question for quantity is how much production, what is the long-term look out of those facilities? I think, you know, as I argue in the book as well, you know, the, the, that long lead time oil sands project investment, those are almost certainly gone. The, the other thing that will determine that is, is how much do we have in terms of expansions of existing mines, existing in situ projects. Um, so I don't have a clean answer to you. I will have to work it out. But I think as a, you know, as a percentage of government revenue, I, you know, we're going to have a hard time continuing to replicate 2022 because both the province is going to grow around it. And I think you're going to see sort of that level and tail off over time. But... Uh, I think still significant. Uh, hey, Andrew. Hey, hey. Uh, Deborah. Uh, Samir Kayande. I'm, uh, I'm the MLA for Calgary Elbow. Um, so I used to be very concerned about asset values um, in, in, in oil sands and other hydrocarbon basins. Um, and now that I got this new gig, I'm actually way more concerned about the previous question, uh, royalties. And the next, the one I'm asking you now is employment. Um, we, we know that like oil sands is low on the cost curve, as you pointed out, um, for existing assets, but it is still high on the cost curve for future growth. Um, so how do you, you know, like, where do you see, even if we're in a high oil price environment, um, you know, they, they, now, now that I'm a public official, it doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort that, uh, that these projects are paying off a lot of debt and sending a lot of money to shareholders um, if, they're, if they're not actually employing people. Uh, so I think, you know, what you're getting at is the question of new project investment. And I think this is something we've seen globally, not just affecting Alberta, that the industry 
is make is happy to make some short term. But I mean, they're under investing relative to peaks, but also their investment is skewing more towards shorter timeline projects. And so, and I think this is kind of true in LNG as well, right? That I want oil now, and I'm willing to pay for oil now. But the investment thesis for an Alberta oil sands project isn't that. It's I want oil starting five plus years from now, and I'd like to continue having oil for 35 to 45 years from that point, and I'd like to continue paying to have it. Um, and I think that's the piece that people still have a really hard time getting over. So I do this comparison with my students of a light tight oil well. I mean, this is old stuff we would have we would have done back in in your days in in the analysis world. But you know, compare a light tight oil well financial model to an oil sands financial model. And you know, by the time the oil sands financial the oil sands project produces its first barrel of oil the light tight oil well has produced like 95% of the oil it's ever gonna produce. So you just have that ability to not care as much about long-term oil market risk and long-term policy risk and anything else, transportation, what have you, with some of these other bets. So I think you know the, the conventional side, I think you're still gonna see some, um, some growth and some new plays and some interest there, but in terms of that willingness to put down on a, on a new greenfield, never been done before oil sands project, I just don't see it. I haven't been run out of the room on that one. Yeah, I don't know, I, but I, I actually have to agree with you. I think that we're gonna see, you know, it's like a Lego project, right? There'll be bits added on, but we won't see that same sort of investment risk because actually it's interesting because um, when Russia invaded, Ukraine, and there were calls to all the major oil sands companies in town saying, you have to increase production. And the comment was, well, yeah, fine, Keystone, and maybe Keystone comes back, but everybody was saying, we're not prepared to invest to increase production to the point where we don't know if that'll actually be realized from a, from an, ex, from an export standpoint. Yeah, I mean, by the time you bring that, like we, I think all hope that by the time you could bring that oil to market, the war's over. Um, and you know, I think the same thing's true of LNG, right? Europe, like we'd like Canadian gas, but the question isn't, do you want Canadian gas now? It's do you want Canadian gas seven to thirty-five years from now? Yeah, that was that was the argument people were making. Yeah. Hi, um, Deborah's question to you earlier uh, in the context of. Uh, Canadian global emissions, which is under 2%, it's more like 1.5. Um, anyways, uh, your answer was that we need uh, to push other countries to act, and um, you know we need to set, set an example. And my question is, do you truly believe that we have uh, any uh, persuasion on countries like China, Russia, OPEC, Venezuela, the US, or India? So, I worry more about the consequence. So I worry more about the consequences we'll face from inaction for the, from those that are concerned. I don't worry as much about our ability to lever China, for example. But I think as you see the consequences, particularly in the U.S. I mean, look what the U.S. is doing right now on clean energy. They've turned the clean energy world upside down. Um, so painting the world, the the U.S. as not acting on climate change, I think misses the most significant climate policy in the world in the last decade. China, you know, look at any graph on renewable energy deployment, they've turned the world upside down. Why is solar the cheapest energy source in the world? It's Chinese action. Look at electric vehicle sales. I mean, Blake, you'd have the numbers to, to hand, but the share of electric vehicle sales in China is off the charts. So I think the myth of, you know, this is Canada doing something that the rest of the world is not doing, I think is wrong. Now. Where do I worry more than can we push others? I worry about the easy policies, the European Union Fuel Quality Directive, the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, policies like that, Keystone XL, where it's really easy politically to beat up on Canada and really easy to say, you know what, um, they're just not doing what we want them to do, banks, financiers, insurance companies, et cetera. Right now, it's very easy to say, we have a no oil sands policy or we have a no Canadian oil and gas policy. I worry much more about them than I do about whether or not we make China move. Um, I have a similar question, actually. Um, uh, I mean, we're sort of 1.5, 2%, um, and we're trying to influence or act cohesively with a bunch of um, other countries in the world, and it feels a lot like a prisoner's dilemma, and this looks like a public common good, and I was just wondering if you had any 
economic perspectives <laughs> on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're you're absolutely right in in that there's a coordination problem, there's a effort selection problem, there are going to be bad actors, there are going to be over aggressive actors, and there's the sort of the whole econ the whole global game around target setting and COP conferences and, and all of these other things. I think, you know, to me, it, it is a global public good problem, and we know how that plays out in economics. Left to its own devices, there will be an under-provision of those global public goods. And so right now we're looking at, you know, pick your estimates, but two to $300 a ton of global damage from carbon emissions today and collectively we're not putting that kind of trade-off on them and so th those damages don't go away because we're like eh, no it's too yeah we just can't get our stuff together it's just that those damages are borne by people and so the question is how can we as canada as two percent of the world or 1.5 percent combine with others to drive some of that action uh, because as as you said i think we're, we're all bearing the costs and you know what if you start dividing you can always get any entity down to a small share of global emissions, right? Yeah, China's one-sixth of the world, but within them are individual companies, individual firms, individual provinces, individual entities that are small shares of global emissions. And, and, and so if you play that game, it's, it's basically a reason for nobody to act on a problem that has really big social costs. Hi, Professor Leach. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have two questions that are related. First, um, energy transition, you know, there's a whole range of numbers that get thrown around about the capital intensivity of that, you know, trillions, et cetera. But it's clear that we've seen, you know, enormous inflation in very capital intensive projects. You look at TMX, you look at Site C, um, you look at any nuclear power project in the last 10 years. What are the policy lever levers you think that can help address that outrageous explosion in capital costs? And second, what's your answer to the Bjorn Lombergs of the world who say it's way too expensive to do anything about climate change? Oh, that's that the the kick, sting was in the tail of that one. Um, but you know, so I think on the capital cost inflation. So Dan Gardner has a, a really nice book on a lot of this, and and I think you know the one that you didn't mention was renewable projects, which is part of the interesting side of it is that. These are readily scalable, replicable. They're exactly what we think we want from these other projects, but the amount of variability between the individual projects is, I think, smaller with renewables than just about with anything else. Batteries might be the exception to that, so, or it might be uh, the parallel to that. So I think you are seeing this cost inflation in a bunch of major projects, and sometimes the common thread between them is ones that have substantial community opposition and need to design or redesign the project through the process to overcome or to accommodate uh, community opposition. And then, of course, the safety and oversight uh, regulations that have changed dramatically with, with something like nuclear. So I think you do see that in a particular type of project. I don't know that you see it to the same degree in other areas. The electricity transmission probably drives into that a little bit, uh, but I don't think you see it in the capital intensity of a lot of the other uh, parts of the energy transition. So to be worried about, but I think it, it's almost an argument against some of, I, I mean, I make the argument in the book against, against nuclear partly on that basis. I, I talk about some advantages to it, but I think it's just like too expensive, too slow to get to market and just doesn't, isn't gonna scale very well. Um, on the Lomberg question, I mean, I take issue in the book with a couple of, of Bjorn Lomberg's things. I mean, one of the things, and as kind of relates to the question in the back, right, where you, if you think about something like a, a Bjorn Lomberg thing might be, you know, we're much better to adapt than to mitigate. And one of the examples I draw on in, in one of his columns is he says, well, you know, if you're faced with adapting to sea level rise or mitigating, mitigating climate change to combat sea level rise, you really should go with adaptation because it's cheaper. But the piece that I think that argument misses is number one, sea level rise is the easiest of them all to adapt to. Right? It doesn't come at you overnight. We see it coming. It's like the steamroller in Austin Powers. You can see it from a long, long, long way away. So it's really easy to adapt to, and it affects a small share of the global population. Um, and if you mitigate, 
you don't just get the mitigating sea level rise, you mitigate every other effect of climate change, stack, 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 stack. If you adapt locally to sea level rise, well, you help yourself locally, you're not actually changing the sea level rise, you're just preventing it from affecting you, you know, at a small infinitesimal margin, you're pushing it somewhere else. The more we adapt, the more you're just pushing that damage away to some degree, mitigating it, but you don't get that stacking effect. And I think that's what Lomborg's things always miss, is that the mitigation expenses, in the same way as it's a public good problem or a public bad problem, those mitigation, the benefits of mitigation stack every climate impact to every person over every year for as long as you've avoided that carbon emission affecting the atmosphere. So that's the piece that I think he misses. Short-termism versus long-termism. Long -term well, short-termism and, and sort of, you know, taking the other, like the, the easy way out of saying, well, of course, we, we're going to be okay. So if you're writing to the average Wall Street Journal reader, you think like some of them are probably in the subway system when it's like water pouring down the stairs and stuff might say, well, maybe we can't adapt to this as easily as we thought, but compared to the cost of global climate change mitigation, it looks doable. But global climate change mitigation prevents that in every city in the world and all of the other effects. So it, it's the adding up, I think. Um, Andrew, thanks very much for your talk. Um, my question relates to the tailings ponds, which you've characterized as a potential environmental calamity. How do we change the policy discourse around that? Are there alternatives that we need to, to start considering? And, and maybe what has to happen for that, that policy discourse to act actually you know, happen? In my like hoped for world, this is the one one of the upsides of the whole renewables moratorium discussion, right? Because when you think of what the renewables moratorium is is mostly about, it's like this fear that somehow a private landowner isn't smart enough to hedge themselves against a private company under contract to use their land, leaving something behind. Um, in the oil sands, we have this system, many of you have probably, it's like that ruling on Trans Mountain. You haven't spent the time reading about it, but the Mine Financial Security Program. And what does it do? It says as long as the value that we assign to your mine today is at least three times as large as the value we assign to your liability, so all of that tailings pond cleanup, we don't need any more security deposit from you. Now, how do they value the mine? They say, what have your profits been over the last three years multiplied by your total reserves? Now, we have, we have a little factor. If the futures curve for the next three years is downward sloping a bit, then we'll adjust that valuation down. So we're looking at this, you know, a generational problem with a three-year forward-looking lens on that value. Um, and then, you know, over time, as these mines get closer to end of life, or prices drop and profits drop, then the government comes in and says, we'd like a security deposit now. The scariest quote for me in the book is a quote from Minister Nixon during COVID, when of course, oil prices dropped, the value of the mines dropped, and now all of a sudden some of these mines might have to give a security deposit. And what did Minister Nixon say? He said, well, the math doesn't work when prices are low. Right? This is like my insurance company telling me that the math doesn't work after I've had an accident. Like, we don't like this deal anymore. Um, you know, that's not why you have insurance. So I think we need to redo that conversation to say, under what circumstances do Albertans want this insurance? We want it if prices are low, and it can't be, come see us when prices are low, and then we'll write you a big check. It's put that money down now tie that money up, link it to the banks, letters of credit, whatever the case may be. But let's not have the mining assets ensuring the future value uh, or the future liabilities associated with those mines. That wouldn't make sense. No business in this town would take that deal. And so we shouldn't take it either. I have one last question for you. Uh, what happens if the carbon tax gets removed? with the new political party like so how does the policy landscape changes uh -huh. because i have done a lot of you know accounting finance so if you remove the 170 you know ton you know so what does the math says um i guess it depends on what replaces it and 
to some degree, then the second order is how do Canadian banks and others respond and insurance companies, et cetera, to a Canada that has less credible action on climate change. And none of that is obvious, right? When Jason Kenney was elected, the first major speech, I think, to the Chamber of Commerce here in Calgary was, if I recall correctly, it was Scotiabank saying, you know, well, carbon policy's gone, let's party. Um, right, that was basically the theme of, of the speech. And so there's going to be a lot of, of thought of that. And I think there's a lot of people who imagine that the carbon price in itself really changes the investment thesis for some of these major projects. Do the math, $170 a ton at 0 .03, or 0 .03, or, eh, 0 0.03 tons per barrel. Eh, it's not really changing your life very much. Now do that math with the ability to do carbon capture and storage. So I think people overestimate the impact of on the industry side of just change the carbon price. The other thing, of course, is car Alberta, what does Alberta do? is the Alberta government, the Alberta government's had carbon pricing longer than any other Canadian province. So Pierre Polyev comes in and says, carbon price is done. Sorry, you don't have that choice. It's an Alberta policy and it's always been an Alberta policy. So what is Alberta gonna do? And I think that's a question that needs to be asked to the premier over and over and over again. Actually, the premier answered that at a, at a fireside chat uh, at the Global Business Forum. Well, there you go. What'd yeah, she say? And she said if he thinks that he can pull back the, the carbon price, uh, that's actually not a realistic scenario. And that's what she said to Gary Marr. There you go. Yeah. Andrew, I'm hoping I can squeeze in one final question um, about optimism. I've you looked at my watch. I guess, you got, I guess you own the room. You can, you can ask as many as you want. <laughs> I've got it for another hour and a half. Um, so you talked about the optimism of oil company CEOs and how that optimism about you know the next 20, 30, 40 years is based on or is often based on effectively a pessimism about policy, right? They basically don't believe that the world, not Canada, but the world will really push ahead on climate policy. And as a result, the demand for oil will stay high. So my question is about whether it's realistic for them to be optimistic about the world demand for oil, um, but independent about policy. So suppose we believe that the world will act on climate policy aggressively, but suppose we also believe, suppose we're techno-optimists. Techno suppose we believe that carbon capture and storage or direct air capture will improve, will become scalable, will become economical, will become widely adopted the world over. And because those technologies become available, then we, can, we, the world, can continue using fossil fuels, including coal. So how crazy is that as a basis for optimism? Um, I wouldn't start there. Uh, you mean because it's crazy? Well, I'm not gonna say that. I still have a Montreal lecture and you, you know, I, I can't set you up too much. But I think if I'm techno-optimistic right now, I look at where the massive progress is in technology, right? And the massive progress in technology. So when I started, I taught my first energy economics class in Alberta in 2007, and Ontario was paying 800 bucks a megawatt hour, or 800 bucks, yeah, 800 bucks a megawatt hour for rooftop solar. Today, that number's 30. Right? Think of what an electric vehicle or an electric truck or et cetera would have cost you 10 years ago, 15 years ago, irrelevant. Now they're taking over the market very, very quickly. So I think from an oil and gas and even coal perspective, you know, we saw what happened, and I used the, the Hemingway quote in, in my book, gradually then suddenly about coal. But I think that's the biggest risk. If you're a techno-optimist, it's not that carbon capture and storage is gonna roll in and save the day, it's that, you know what, we've really underestimated what a 700 mile range electric vehicle does to gasoline demand and how quickly it does it. You know, what does that technology translate into trucking? What does 30 or three cent a kilowatt hour solar mean for hydrogen production and the amount of natural gas that we flow into the hydrogen supply chain? So the techno, and even small modular reactors, right? Like if I'm a techno optimist, this is something that I've always thought about is, you know, we're, we're quick to say, well, hey, a small modular reactor is a great fit in the oil sands which it's true if you think about it in a vacuum, 
But if you're like, I can put a shipping container sized nuclear power plant that's safe enough for people to be confident in, I can put it anywhere in the world, what does that mean for our global energy system? And are we really still mining oil sands to produce transportation fuels and shipping it around the world in pipelines? Because we have access to cheap, clean electricity anywhere you want in the world. And so that's the techno-optimism. Like, I think it's the combustion, that, that inherent inefficiency in combustion engines that really gets hit first in a techno-optimism world. So I, you know, I, I feel like if your business is fundamentally about combustion, then techno-optimism is bad for you. Does that mean we stop flying? It doesn't mean we stop flying, but fundamentally the share of the global barrel that right now is in passenger vehicles and freight is still pretty, is still pretty large. And so I, you know, I think we're absolutely gonna have niche uses or big niche uses for fossil fuels. Same way as like we still generate power Coal is still attractive in some regions, but it's going through the floor. So I think you're going to see that. You're going to see, you know, we're, still, we're running transatlantic flights on biofuels, so you're going to see some of that. Regionals on electric. Well, but, you know, we say, okay, where were we? And I, I did this thing with my students the other day of, of telling them, okay, 2035 as an as a electricity target. So how far are we from there, and what's the world going to look like? Well, if you rewind back that far in time, I was an economics undergrad student. So I was going to class with my Walkman and my two cassette tapes and my four sets of batteries. And I was sitting through class taking notes on a clipboard. And I had a computer that was on my desktop that could have anchored a boat. And it cost me $4,000 in like 1996 dollars. And I'm explaining all this to them. And I said, how does that compare to your life? You've got your, you know, a computer that's a million times more powerful than my boat anchor computer and costs less in nominal dollars in the pocket of your jacket. And you know, you're not carrying around extra batteries, you're not carrying, and so what is the world gonna look like with 15 years more progress? And I, I don't think we can know, I don't know. I'm, I, I think the techno optimist in me is like, that's when it gets, it's the gradually then suddenly things get really tough really fast if you are relying on combustion so in the vernacular of the um, of the chemistry experiment with potassium permanganate you all of a sudden just turn purple you're fully titrated <laughs> I, okay. I should can I have that as my Twitter bio like fully titrated and no one will know what it means except you <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the, f the end of the first part of this event. I want to thank Andrew for a terrific talk, uh, Ken White in absentia for publishing this book, Deborah uh, for a great interview and conversation, and all of you for attending this inaugural McGill Max Bell Lectures. I also want to thank again Mr. Tom Cairns uh, for his vision and generosity without which we would not be here tonight. Um, finally, an enormous thank to two individuals who have been working with me over the past several months putting all of this together, and I don't see them here, but you saw them on the way in, V. Weston, v. Weston and Adriana Goretta, and I don't know if she's here, but thank you very much. Andrew will be in Montreal next week, November 2nd, for the third and final installment of this year's lectures on the question of whether Canada's cold temperatures mean that we can take a less aggressive policy response to climate change. So you may have a sense of what he's going to say there. Please feel free to join us if you happen to be popping through Montreal. There's no snow, by the way. I uh, can't promise that for next week, but today there's no snow. Uh, or instead, you can join us on live streaming. One final word. Uh, as you know, this is the first of annual McGill Max Bell lectures. That suggests that at some point in the future there will be a second. So a year from now, next fall, the second installment will take place. So please watch this space. Uh, check out our Twitter feed, check out our website, whatever. Um, early in January or February, we will be announcing uh, our next lecturer and topic for fall of 2024. So now I invite you all to join us, I think it's through here, for a drink and some snacks, and hopefully you can get Andrew to sign your book. Thank you very much. <laughs>